right, so uh, we've made it out to Houston, and this is the, the, our first day here, our first stop, and we are west of the city of Houston at the flagship campus of uh, Knowledge is Power uh, Charter School franchise. Uh, it is the nation's largest uh, charter school operator. It, it's, it's quite an old one. It was founded in 1994 uh, by two uh, alumni of Teach for America. That's uh, Mike Feinberg and Dave Levin. Uh, Dave Levin came out of Yale and Mike Feinberg came out of the University of Pennsylvania, my neck of the woods. Um, this is sort of going back to my early entry into sort of investigating these systems of money and power. Um, if, for folks who follow me, you'll, re you'll know that my entry point came in through uh, privatization of public schools in Philadelphia and school closures that happened at the behest of Boston Consult Consulting Group in partnership with our state controlled uh, school reform commission. And at the time, the big push was to uh, redirect resources, public resources, away from regular neighborhood schools into charter operators. And that was, had devastating consequences for the students in the public schools as well. Um, at the same time, it was aligned with the development of common core state standards uh, and the regime of uh, high stakes testing. And really, I didn't fully understand it at the time, but a system of cybernetic control over the minds of the youth. And increasingly, that data was not just going to be used to uh, close schools and put schools under additional scrutiny, but would also ultimately lead into uh, human capital social impact markets tied to United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is education. And so teachers were never going to be able to collect the amount of real-time data that the hedge fund markets required to bet on these speculative future human capital bonds tied to pay for success finance, which was embedded in the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so increasingly students had to um, interact with their education through devices, which at the time were pretty cheap Chromebooks, also tablets, but then increasingly moving forward, it's likely to be um, uh, wearable technology, including virtual reality. And as all of these uh, systems were advancing forward, the charter schools were uh, uh, test beds for a lot of the technology and at the time what they called blended learning, which was a hybrid of having face-to-face -face learning and device-based learning. Uh, because charters existed sort of as a state of exception that the rules that applied to public schools that were often used in pretty brutal ways uh, could be lifted for charter school operators so that they could be innovative and creative and test out a lot of the technologies that would be then bounced back into the public school systems. Um, KIPP is very powerful. Um, like I said, they have an affiliation with, with Teach for America. Um, their program is essentially to, um, the premise is that you recruit the best and brightest of you know, the nation's universities, uh, young people who aren't actually trained in education or child development, and then you would sort of put them through a very rigorous boot camp type of pro training program, an alternative certification program, um, and then they would be required to teach for, I think, two or three years. And then after that time, they would have a tremendous forgiveness of their student loan debt, which was a, 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 you know, quite an incentive, and oftentimes then placed in very plum positions, often in financial institutions like Goldman Sachs. And so the Teach for America pipeline brought in very inexperienced teachers with the intention that they were never going to stay to become career uh, educators, that they would be cycled in and out um, to enact data-driven policy schemes in alternative school networks and then rolled back out into positions of power to enact um, more data-driven policies and create more repressive regimes. But they've been brought into the fold, so it was all one big club, and then the KIPP franchise was a huge part of that. Although the framing of the franchise, it, 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 it's, it sort of, it exemplifies what came to be known as no excuses charter schools. Now, the, the students that attend these charter schools are largely uh, black and brown populations, black and Latino students, a very high percentage, like maybe 90% plus. And it is being framed as given, giving these children options that are not available to them in neighborhood schools. Um, which, because the neighborhood schools are being intentionally broken down, in some respects, that, that is the case. But the scenario that KIPP provides, the knowledge is power, provides is this um, work hard, be nice. 
um, no excuses. And so it's very behaviorist. It's very um, repressive. There are many, many rules. Uh, there is a lot of sort of coercive peer pressure. And there is a sense of students needing to comply at every level. Um, that means con controlling their social relations, controlling their physical bodies, requiring them to track the teachers, requiring certain hand motions, um, requiring them to earn access to um, school uniforms, desks, uh, perks. And if they do not comply at every level, then those privileges, these basic items that you would need for education are um, rescinded and students are, were like a, a major part of it was public humiliation and sort of breaking down these children um, uh, through a program that in many respects came, up, came out of Martin Seligman's work, who was a partner with KIPP. Uh, he's from the Penn Positive Psychology Program. It was called Learned Helplessness. And so you're expected to sort of operate in, under conditions of extreme duress in intermittent stages, and then eventually people just break down and give up and just um, turn into sort of robots or zombies. And a lot of those um, scenarios applied not only to the students, but for the teachers that were run through these programs. So, um, you know, it's an important place to start our day in Houston here because a lot of what Houston is about is about energy, um, big oil and now alternative energy and that alternative energy being built into nanotechnology. And so one of the major investors in the KIPP Charter franchise um, included John Arnold, who um, made a lot of money in Enron and then created his own uh, venture capital firm trading in energy futures and became sort of like the youngest billionaire in North America sort of early on in his early 40s, I think. And once you understand managing these children, like managing vulnerable populations as an energy asset, as a speculative trading commodity, as something that if you can get enough real-time data analytics, you can um, manage those markets both to make money when these children's futures improve, uh, but also as we've talked about in the hedge fund market, there are whole markets in um, shorting these markets, right? And embedding that these children's outcomes do not improve. Um, so KIPP is central in that it is, again, the largest charter franchise. It's been around since 1994. It has ties through the University of Pennsylvania, has a close partnership with the University of Pennsylvania of bringing students from KIPP into um, the Penn system. And once you understand that the whole social impact investment, human capital futures markets really runs on um, intergenerational trauma and poverty, and then also manufactured trauma and poverty, black and brown populations are the, as sick as it sounds, like the best um, option for improving people's lives as outcomes on data dashboards and that that is a key part of the game that is going to be played on blockchain. And so a charter network that has ties to social impact finance um, through the University of Pennsylvania, has ties to um, sort of neoliberal economic policy making, has ties to um, high technology interests, has ties to big oil and the energy. Um, these are all really crucial. Um, it's a crucial context. So I think, I think that clears us up. But oh, lastly, they, they do, um, the students that survive at KIPP, many of them leave. Many of them cannot tolerate um, the level of coercion that is involved in this education approach. But if they um, manage to make it through, then they will be rewarded with these pipelines into elite education and often elite jobs. And in the human capital bond markets, they do need um, members of those vulnerable communities, members of black and brown and, and impoverished communities to be fronting for these policies. Because if these policies were advanced by um, predominantly white male oil interests, people would be up in arms. And so in many respects, these, these um, franchises are bringing, bringing these students along and they have a very long time frame, right? Like we're talking 1994, you know, we're, we're 25 years into this and now things are really fully coming in place with the blockchain identity. So um, pay attention to KIPP and this is just the first stop on our day in Houston.